Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Hey, good morning, church family. How are you? I'm here in Pakistan. Dr. Paul is with me, Pastor Salvador, Casey, Brandon. God is really opening doors for us. We appreciate that you have allowed us to be here. Pray that you have a wonderful service today. And as you are in the service, would you begin to pray for us? As you can tell, I'm a little bit hoarse, and I would really appreciate your prayers. We do another event tonight, and then our big event is Tuesday night. Hey, you're in good hands today with Pastor Adam and the team. I love you. I'll see you soon. Thank you. You turn to your Bibles in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. If you have uh, the New Living Translations that we um, help you uh, retrieve here, it's page uh, 335, 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. And so um, the, the, the title of today's sermon is Never Let a Crisis Go to Waste. Never let a crisis go to waste. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at Elijah's life, his life of victories, and also his life of struggles, and how they mirror our very own lives that we live today, how his journey of faith is comparable to our own journey of faith. Okay? And so we're going to be in 1 Kings 18 and 19, but let me kind of bring you to where are we in the middle of this book of 1 Kings, right? So King Solomon, who was a king of wisdom, God granted him great wisdom, though he didn't use it to a godly way all the time, okay? But King Solomon was was the king. He deceased, he died, there was other kings that came up, but after he died, Israel is now a divided kingdom because there was a civil war. And the civil war divided Israel and it made the northern part and the southern part. So we're split. North and south. Northern Israel, there were ten tribes that went to the north, and there were two tribes that went to the south. The southern two tribes, one of those two tribes that went to the south was one of Judah, the tribe of Judah. And so now the southern part of Israel is called Judah. Okay? The northern part of Israel is called, the northern part is called Israel of Jerusalem. And so um, we're talking about those areas today. We're more focused on the northern part, okay, with uh, King Ahab. Now, in the southern part is Jerusalem, and that's where the temple is, and that's where, you know, they would go to worship. Well, if that's in the southern part and you're in the northern part, then King Ahab doesn't want you to go to the south to worship. He wants you to worship in his territory, right? His gods, okay? And so in the northern kingdom, King Ahab, who is ruling, is ruling to serve Baal and Asherah, okay? And so we're going to look this morning at Ahab, Jezebel, Elijah, and the God of Elijah, and the little g, gods of King Ahab. So what I see here as I read, though, I see the primary objective of God sending Elijah, because see, in, in, in those times, God would typically send a prophetic individual, a prophet, to the kings to guide them and give them wisdom. For example, David had uh, Nathan, right? Prophet Nathan came through. Well, the prophet that was sent to Ahab was Elijah. Okay? And so what I see, though, is that God's purpose in sending Elijah was to get the people to turn their hearts back to him, to ultimately serve Big G, capital God, God, the King of Kings, Yahweh, 
and not to serve the other gods. And so to me, that's kind of the whole purpose of everything that's going around. The influence, though, that's coming to serve the other gods, Baal and Asherah, is coming from the current king and a lot of influence from Jezebel, right? <clears throat> okay, so as we look at this this morning, now King Ahab, you can actually read a, a commentary on King Ahab if you turn, just flip a, a page forward there in, in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. Uh, it gives a commentary on King Ahab. And it says in 1 Kings 16.30, it says, uh, Ahab is the son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. And as though it were not enough to follow the example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians, and he began to bow down in worship of Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any other kings of Israel before him. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, more than any other kings before him. And you see there in verse 42, what did he do? He built a temple not for the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but for the God of Baal and directed all of those people to worship Baal. So let's talk here a second. So Baal is it's kind of a generic term for little, cap, lowercase l. You guys follow me? Lord. And so they would... The northern king is referring to the god of Baal as uh, the, the god of the solar system, of storms, uh, the god who brought rain and bountiful harvests, okay? That's what they're recognizing him, uh, the, the, the god of Baal in the northern kingdom as. So you could have a god of and still call it Baal, but it might mean a little bit differently, okay? It's a generic term. But in the northern kingdom... The god of Baal is this god of storms and harvest and rain, okay? And the counterpart of Baal is Asherah. And Asherah, or the Asherah poles, that was the goddess. It's a counterpart of Baal. It was the goddess of fertility or sexual perversion. And so that's what he's pushing the people to worship during this time and during this reign. So we know that King Ahab... I'm still getting you focusing in on chapter 10 and, or 18 and 19, right? So King Ahab, we know, was a very evil king. And he married Jezebel, who was a pagan woman, and he allowed her to promote the worship of Baal. Okay? And it's interesting, and, and for your studies the rest of this week, read the rest of 1 Kings and then to 2 Kings. Um, king Ahab was a very pouty individual. He sulked on his bed. If you, don't, if you don't recall, when he didn't get the vineyard, right? He pouted. And it says several times in the scripture there that he socked and he pouted, okay? So you can kind of see, and, um, you know, so Jebez Jezebel went out and had Naboth, the, the landowner, killed. And I might touch on that uh, when we speak Wednesday night, but um, very, very interesting. So God sends his prophets, as we said earlier, to advise and to counsel them. And... Um, it's interesting, and, and I love the scripture because, uh, you know, if you just want to read a great book, just read the Bible because how does Ahab die? Do you remember? It, it's prophetically said that the dogs would lick the blood from his chariot. And so later it says in scripture that he bleeds out in his chariot, and when they're washing out his chariot and cleaning it out, the dogs come and lick all that stuff up. And I think it's just cool because it's just action and, you know, drama and all kinds of great things in the scripture. But it fulfilled prophecy just to show the, the uh, incredible power of scripture that we have. But King, King Ahab is a very wicked, greedy, passive, sullen, uh, angry individual. So let's talk about Jezebel for a second. You can see Jezebel, a little writing on Jezebel if you flip over to 1 Kings 21, 25. Let's read about her here a second. 1 Kings 21, 25 says, and this also talks about uh, King Ahab. 1 Kings 21, 25, no one else has so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did, here we go, under the influence of his wife Jezebel. Okay, now you have to understand, we said earlier that Jezebel's father was Eth 
Baal, E-T-H-B-A-A-L, same as the little G God, Baal, right? He was a priest of Baal, not a prophet of Baal, but a priest of Baal. So can you imagine Jezebel growing up as her father being the priest of Baal? She brought some incredible influence into the marriage of Ahab, being the pouty, whiny uh, person that he is. And you know, I, I have to bring this out to you because my imagination runs wild. I see Jezebel as a woman who smokes cigars and chews tobacco. I just do. And she literally wears the pants in the palace because you have King Ahab having a royal fit all the time. Get my joke? Royal, king royal, fit. A royal fit all the time, and she just wears the pants. Fine, Ahab, you want this? I'll go get it for you. Quit sulking on your bed. Here, there, there's your vineyard now. And she has a deep voice because she smokes cigarettes and big cigars. And, you know, she's just, so you have Jezebel in the palace, right? That's just what I see. I see little Ahab just running around like a puppet and, and Jezebel's really. And she's so influential because it's her, her father, who is the priest of Baal, that's bringing all of that influence into the northern kingdom. It really is. And he's just letting it go and letting it go. And God's saying, no, I'm you sending a king or a prophet Elijah to you to say, no, that you're leading the people the wrong way. I have go this way, this way. Here's the proper way to lead the people as a king. And he's just not, he's not listening. He's not listening. So Revelations 2.20, we know that Jezebel's name is used in an example of people who completely reject God in one of the great evil. Very, very interesting. Okay, and, and you can see in scripture that she supported 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. She supported them because it says in scripture, as we're going to read, she fed them. So it's kind of like in the political realm, she supports them by all kinds of financial things. And she has all these prophets that are doing what? The prophets of Baal and uh, Asherah. They're out into the kingdom. They're out into the community, constantly influencing the people to worship her gods, not the true God. Okay, and so, um, you know, a little side note. No, I don't have points, but I have little take-homes. A good take-home here from Jezebel and King Ahab is be careful who you marry. There's a lot of influence in who you marry and who you get into relationship with. And, you know, I can say that we're proud to say that our daughter's engaged to a great young man, Braden Koontz, and we're very pleased with that, and so I'm not referencing that, okay? They're scheduled and, and uh, going to get married in, in August, and we're very happy with that. But I'm just saying be careful who you hang around with, who you're in relationship with, who you marry, and, and different things like that because there's a lot of influence there, okay? And so now let's look at Elijah before we jump into Scripture here. Elijah's name means my God is Yahweh. You guys are way behind. Okay. Maybe you've been jumping through there. I'm not sure. But okay. Elijah. Did you guys, was, was Jezebel up there in the scriptures and all that stuff? Huh? Yes? Good job. You guys are awesome back there. Thanks. Okay. See, I don't see that back there. I was looking up here. But Elijah means my God is Yahweh. Yahweh means I am who I am. It is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That is who Elijah is out message, sending the message for, trying to get people to believe in the God who is the God, that I am who I am. Okay? And so we know things about Elijah. Elijah performed many miracles in God's name. His uh, demonstration and power over nature, other gods, and, and, um, and, and so many different things. His dependence on God, his bright light in such a time of darkness is incredible. His single-minded to com uh, his single-minded commitment to God challenges us. There's many amazing miracles that accomplished, you know, through um, Elijah. And as we're jumping into Scripture here now, you can see that. Remember, he prayed for the rain to stop. And we're jumping in here, where Scripture where the rain has stopped for three years. And then don't forget that who who was it that appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and. Uh, and James and then was uh, Moses and Elijah, right? Up on the Mount of Transfiguration. So cool stuff. But uh, let's jump into scripture here now. Uh, we're in 1 Kings 18. And so it says in 1 Kings 18, here we are. Later on in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, go present yourself to King Ahab. Now, I think it's just interesting that Something that God was doing to get Ahab's attention was weather, storm, 
What does the God of Baal stand for? Harvest, storm, rain, weather. What does the other big G God do? Oh, he just stops it all. Hey, hold on. So this is happening to, to get attention of King Ahab and say, yo, your God is, well, then pray to your God and have him make it rain already. You know, here we are three years in. Okay. And so we're three years in, things are getting really dry. And the Lord uh, said to Elijah, listen, I want you to go present yourself now to King Ahab. And so tell Ahab that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to uh, appear before Ahab. And you can see there that Obadiah, now just again, super incredible. Here we have Obadiah who is in the, in the king's place. It says that uh, he was in charge of the palace, right? And so I, Obadiah is already in the palace. You have a Christian influence in the palace with King Ahab all the time. You and I can influence people all the time for Jesus. I just see him there as constantly planting Christian seeds into King Ahab constantly. He's in there. It says right there, you can read that he, he took the prophets and he saved them. And so you know he's not quiet about his Christian faith. Okay, so he's there in the palace constantly witnessing to King Ahab. And then Elijah like comes and pours water on the seeds that were already planted. And you and I can be the ones who plant seed or, or pour the water on and people come to know and in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it says there, we're not going to read all the way down through there, but Obadiah was walking along. He, see, he saw Elijah and I just think it's, it's great because, uh, you know, Ahab says this, I'm going to come present myself to King Ahab. Uh, I'm sorry, Elijah says, I'm going to come present myself to King Ahab. And Obadiah's like, listen, I've heard these things before. And the times that you didn't show up, King Ahab killed those people. So you've really got to promise me, promise me you're going to show up this time. Uh, because Elijah's known for disappearing and showing up at another place really quickly. And you're, you're going to see that. He girds up his belt, right? And he quickly gets transported from one place to the next. And so he must be known for this kind of thing because Obadiah's begging him, listen, if you're telling me you're going to show before the king today, please do so because he will just have my head off my shoulders. You've really got to show up today. All right. So jump in now to verse 16. Obadiah went to tell King Ahab that Elijah had come and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, so it is really you, you troublemaker of Israel. See, King Ahab doesn't like what Elijah has to say. He just thinks he does, does nothing but bring trouble. And he really doesn't because, verse 18, it says, I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you, King Ahab, and your family are the troublemakers because you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal. Now, here's what I want you to do, King Ahab. You summon all of Israel. Everybody in your northern kingdom, here's what we're going to do. You're going to meet me on Mount Carmel. Get the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Jezebel, and let's meet on the mountain of Carmel. The mountain of Carmel separates, if you care, the Mediterranean Sea, about 20 feet or 20 miles mountain ridge and then you have the Jezreel Valley. The Jezreel Valley it means um, uh, God of vineyards. God of vineyards. Beautiful green plush flowers, vineyards. This is where Naboth's owns property that the king wants next to his palace because it's such a beautiful gorgeous place. Okay and so um, that, that's kind of the territory in which we're at. So what I see here that's about to take place, and you guys all know the story about meeting up on uh, Mount Carmel. It's kind of like an old-fashioned Google search of reviews. Okay, so think about this with me for a minute. Um, everybody probably knows of two auto insurance companies, Progressive and Geico, right? I mean, has anybody not heard of Progressive and Geico? Why? Because they spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to stay in front of you by advertising. All right. So let's say you need to choose an auto insurance company for yourself, either Progressive or Geico. And so you're going to do what everybody does. You're going to get online and Google reviews for these two insurance companies, right? Which one's going to pay out the best when I hit a deer, the fastest? Which one's going to have the best service? Do I have to take my car to get it adjusted at a body shop or are they going to send somebody to the place of my car? Do I have to pay? To, you know, and you're going to look at all those different things. You're do, having a review. You're reading the reviews on Geico and Progressive, or we're about to see an old-fashioned review of Baal and Yahweh, okay? Now, don't forget, you can't have auto insurance with both Geico and Progressive. You have to choose one or the other. 
You cannot be in contract when you sign your papers with both of them. Only one. Or let's say contract. You can only be in relationship with one auto insurance company at a time. One. You have to choose which one you're going to purchase. Right? So that's what we have here. We have an old-fashioned review. Call the whole town out. Come on, King Ahab, get them all out. Let's go. It's time for a big old review. Let's do this. So you bring some bulls, all of your prophets, you build an altar, and have at it. Right? So they do. Over there they are, and they're calling on the God of Baal. Right? And then Elijah is just hanging out. And, you know, he was kind of like, he reminds me of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, scruff, clothes. You know, he's just, uh, he's just a redneck guy. He's just, uh, come on, guys. Let's go, you know, let's do this thing. And so what's going down here, right? So it says that, uh, let's go to verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls, prepare it, call in the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. They called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, answer us. There was no reply. They danced, they hobbled around the altar, and noontime came. And this is where you have trash talk in the Bible, right here. This is trash talk in the Bible. Noontime came. Elijah's had it. I've been here all morning. And what does he say here? Check this out. Elijah shouts, listen, you have shouted louder Listen, if, if you would have shouted louder, he scoffed. He's a god. Perhaps your god is daydreaming at this moment or relieving himself. Maybe he's on the pot. That's literally what it means. Or maybe he went on a trip and he's just not here right now. Maybe your god fell asleep and he needs to be woken up. So all of these prophets and everybody shouted louder and louder and their customs were to cut themselves, make themselves bleed out. They took knives and swords until the blood gushed out all over themselves and they raved all afternoon calling down their God to set their, all, their sacrifice on fire. And so the evening sacrifice, still there was no sound, no reply. Then Elijah called all the people and said, okay, this review is completed. Let's go now over here and review the God of Elijah or Yahweh. And so Elijah called to the people, come over here. They crowded around him. And the whole town's here, not just the prophets, the whole town is here. So he prepared the altar of the Lord that was been torn down, 12 stones representing 12 tribes of Israel. He used the stones to rebuild the altar of the Lord. He drug a trench around it, and what did he do? There were four large jars, three times. He said, guys, get those, all four of those jars, dump it on the altar. Again, again, and again. Again, so much that there was water in the trench around the altar, and it was just, looked like they pulled everything out of the river. I mean, it was just mud flying, gushing. I mean, it's just wet as wet can be. And then as the usual time came for the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and said, Oh, Lord God, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today who you are that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done as you commanded, O Lord. Answer me. These people, and these people, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back yourself, back to the land. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust that even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, capital L, E, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. And so the review was complete, and they saw with their own eyes which was the best choice. You see, we as individuals, as Christians, we are human, we are created to worship, we are created to praise. You are praising and worshiping something. It's either Yahweh, God, capital G, or it's something else. It's just something else. You have to choose between one of the two. And you see, it's very interesting here because the root of this problem is not the idol worship. It's a problem. But the root of the problem, if you go back in your scripture to verse 21, 1 Kings 18, 
21, here is the root of the issue. Elijah stood in front of them and he said, how much longer will you waver and hobble between the two opinions? How much longer will you waver and hobble between the God, Yahweh, or Baal? How much longer, folks, will we stand with one foot out of church and one foot in church? Or in your Christian life, in relationship with him, but one foot out. But I like to do this once in a while. But how long will you waver? You're worshiping one or the other. You can only choose one auto insurance company. You might say, well, no, I'm only over here a little bit. No, you chose one or the other. You have to. And it's about relationship. You know, I think, and me, myself, I, you get all caught up in Romans. You know, confess, believe, confess, believe, confess with your heart, believe your mouth. You know, that's not right. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, right? But it's, it's relationship. Which one are you in relationship with? Yeah, if I'm re in relationship with progressive, then I believe in progressive. You know, you see, I, I, I'm in relationship, so I believe. Sometimes we get all caught up on the belief factor. I can't completely believe all of this. Well, if you're in relationship with them, then you've already shown that you believe. And so continue to progress in that area of belief. Now, if you go back over to verse, verse 40 with me, it says, Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So they took all the people. Who took all the people? The townspeople. They took them all down to the, Kindra, the, the Kishon Valley, and they killed them there. And what I love about this, the influence has been killed. All of that influence of Jezebel, all 850 people that were running all over town trying to get them to worship the other God has now been killed. Why? Because it says that they just fell face on their ground and cried out, God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are the Lord. He is the God. Yes, you are the God. You are the God. Not this one, but this one is the God. And the influence got less and less. Right? And your life, if you're focused more on God, the influence and in what's pulling you down gets less and less. It takes it away. It gets dimmer and dimmer. So what happened next? You know the story. Elijah's praying for rain, and Elijah's a great man of faith, and it says there in verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, go. Ahab, get something to eat and drink, because I hear a mighty rainstorm, a rainstorm coming. I'm telling you, it's going to rain now. Not only did God show himself here, now the drought's going to be over. It's going to rain. The big G God's going to make it rain. Your Baal can't bring it. It's already been seen. Now he's going to show you again. It's going to start to rain. And so Ahab went, ate and drank. Now what did Elijah do? I love it. He did what Jesus did. He went and retrieved himself and took him place to a prayer, place in prayer. He bowed down to God and prayed and worshiped him. And Elijah ate. And so seven times, seven times, Elijah tells his, his servant, go check. Do you see a cloud? 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 No, 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 no. Yes, yes, about the size of a man's hand. Run down, run down and tell King Ahab it's coming. He's got to get back to the palace or he's not going to make it because torrential downpour is coming. Get your little chariot you're going to be killed in. He doesn't say that. Get your little chariot, your horsey, and go, 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 go. You're not going to make it back if you don't get ahead of this rainstorm. And then it says, what does it say? It says that Elijah... Uh, girded up his belt. I can't see it right there. Girded up his belt and then he beat him back. Like he beat him back to the town. But then you have in verse 19, it says that King Ahab went in and said, hey, Jesse. Jesse, where are you? Honey, you got to sit down. Jesse, you're not going to like this. You know that Elijah that always brings trouble. Yes, honey, give me my cigar and my chew. What are you going to tell me now? He wiped them all out. Wiped who out? All 850 of your prophets. He killed them all. What did he do? Give me another drink. He wiped them all out, Jezzy. And what does she say right there in chapter 19? So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods... Little G, strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed 
all the prophets. And look what happened to Elijah, this great man of God. It says that he was afraid and fled for his life. Fear gripped his heart like none other. We're talking about a man who led miracles and called down fire from heaven, stopped the weather, started the weather. This Jezebel, snuff chewing, cigarette smoking, cigars blowing, put a little hit on his life and he falls he falls to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest pit. He is fearful. It struck his soul, his mind to no end. Remember, he runs out underneath the broom tree, right? And God says, yo, Elijah, what are you doing? It says that he ran. It's about 115 miles. He took off running for his life, this great man of God. How do we allow fear to settle into our hearts so easily? And I'm not saying don't, it don't happen. There it's happening to this great man of God, but what, what happens next? So he's out under the broom tree and, and he's starving and he's hungry because he didn't eat. He was fasting. He went to pray and he's under the broom tree. And it says that God brought him bread on a hot stone. And I'm bringing this to more modern times. God brought him a whole dozen of Krispy Kreme donuts. It's what it says right there, a hot bread on a stone. He's giving him exactly what he needs. He brought him a whole pile of Krispy Kreme donuts and said, listen, eat and drink. Your journey's not over. You got to get some energy. So there he is under the broom tree. And he takes off running again. And now where is he found? He's found in chapter 19, uh, verse 9. Okay, 8. So he got up, ate and drank the food. It was given to him. Enough strength for 40 days and 40 nights. He went to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave and he spent the night. And now the Lord speaks to him again. You know, he's already speaking to him under the broom tree. He speaks to him again. He says, the Lord said to him, Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? And Elijah says, listen, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are now trying to kill me. Now, I, I've got to ask Elijah this. I don't understand. I honestly don't. There in verse 10, he says he's the only one. If you flip your pages, God says over here, no, Elijah, there's 7,000 in verse 18 people who have never bowed down. But Elijah feels like he's the only one. He's not. Do you feel like you're the only one out there sometimes? You're not. There's still brothers, Christians, brothers and sisters around you. There's still some in the palace witnessing to the king that you're trying to witness to too. You see? He said, they torn down your altars. And then what does it say here? So Elijah is in the cave and God says, go out. Now, I want you to jump down to verse 13. It says again that Elijah went out and stood. So as these things start to happen, Elijah runs back into the cave because he's out, he's in, he's out, he's in, right? So God said, listen, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And the Lord told him, and as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Elijah, what are you doing here? I'm running for my life. I'm scared to death. And the wind starts to blow and whip so bad he steps back in. And the earth starts to shake and fire starts to burn. And, but there's this voice. Think about something with me for a second. You ever go for a walk in the woods? Go, ever go on a trail down the woods? Right? Why is it when I'm walking on the trail or biking on the trail, every single log, tree, branch that falls has to go perpendicular across my trail? What, what's with that? I got to get off my bike. I got to pick it up. I got to find the way around. I got to climb over. I got to step over. And I got to go down my trail then. Why is that? Why do they all have to fall this way and not this way?
Well, the truth of the matter is, they are parallel and perpendicular. But in my pathway, the only ones that stand out to me, the only ones that are loud in my walk on the path, in my journey in life, are those that are laying in my pathway. Right? They're over there. Take a look. There's all kinds of logs laying this way too, but that one that's laying across my pathway is the one that speaks the loudest. And so what do you have here? You have all this noise and confusion and thoughts and emotions tearing at Elijah in his mind and life running fearful from a crisis that has taken place. And his life, and he's so, it's so crazy and busy, but I love what it says, the still, small, tiny, little voice. Did Elijah hear the voice? Yes. And the take home from that is, it is not difficult to hear the voice of God. It is not difficult for you as an individual to hear the voice of God. It says earlier he spoke to him and they back and forth, but now all the noise and everything, there was still that voice speaking to him and he heard the voice. I don't know what crisis, I don't know what challenge, I don't know what doctor's report, I don't know what you may have received in the mail, phone call, what relationship has changed. I don't know in your life how noisy things are or have gotten. But I do know one thing, the voice of God is still being spoken for you on an individual basis to hear his voice speak to you. And so I want to ask you this morning as Ricky begins to close, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? And this just doesn't need to be for right now. This can be every day. Remember I started out saying, in his presence, we're experiencing Holy Spirit. You you don't only enter into the presence of God at church. Yes, as we come together corporately, it's amazing, it's awesome. As you worship, hopefully, God, or choose which auto come. You worship the King. His presence will come and surround you. So will you stand with me this morning? Let's take just a moment, individually, looking at God, looking towards heaven and saying, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? And you can ask this each and every day. The Holy Spirit is your provider, your counselor, your comforter, your savior, your deliverer, all those come in Yahweh. God. And so what is it that you need today? I want to encourage you each and every day as you read, as you pray, as you enter the presence of God, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? And I'm going to tell you, a lot of times it's a still, small voice. Oh, you can hear it. And a lot of times it just might be one word. I love you. Comfort. Hope strength. It might be something like go, stop, sell. I don't know. I don't know. Call the doctor. Call this person. I I don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to say to you. But I want us as individuals to begin to seek out that still, small, individual voice saying, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Ricky will close us out from here. God bless you.